Let's pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grant me, O Lord, a mind to know you, a heart to seek you, wisdom to find you, conduct pleasing to you, faithful perseverance in waiting for you, and a hope of finally embracing you. Amen. Amen. Brother Phil, I'm going to hand it off to you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, it's been my pleasure to come to know uh, Cardinal O'Malley as uh, a brother in the Capuchin province, which we share in life as St. Augustine province. Uh, Cardinal Sean is from Lakewood. So there's a born in Lakewood and baptized at St. Luke Church in Lakewood, which is where I grew up. And we share that as well. He did his uh, formation all through our province, went to Catholic University. And in while he was in Washington, grew connected with the El Salvadoran uh, immigrant community that was fleeing the Civil War at that time in Washington, establishing a large community in D.C. Uh, he became went on to become a, a bishop of the Virgin Islands, and then in Fall River, Massachusetts, West Palm Beach, Florida, and now in Boston. Uh, each time encountering really serious issues of clergy child abuse in each of the dioceses he went has become a leader in the church of, of that reconciliation process of working through church structures and um, directly with the victims of abuse and is one of the leaders in a worldwide church in, in that regard and is also a member of the council of nine uh, the ca nine cardinals who are very close uh, advisors to pope francis so he is a, a man of remarkable energy gifts and he must be able to bilocate because he is so many different places at the same time doing many many things so we're real happy uh, tonight that he can free up an hour and a half or so of his really busy schedule and to be with us and to share uh, his experience of the church today you have one of the great leaders of the church today on this zoom conference and um open to many questions and i hope it's be i know it's gonna be a great evening thank you Thank you very much, Phil, for your very kind words. Uh, I don't know how many of you have read McCullough's uh, biography of the Wright brothers. Uh, McCullough is a wonderful local historian here in Massachusetts and uh, has written so many wonderful biographies of Jefferson and Adams. And, but he wrote a wonderful biography of the Wright brothers. And uh, at the beginning of the book, he quotes Orville Wright, who, when they asked him, they said, what's the secret of your success? And Orville Wright said, well, he said, uh, I chose very good parents, he said. And secondly, I spent the few, first few years of my life in Ohio. So I've been blessed with very good parents and uh, spent the few, first few years of my life in Ohio. Uh, but I'm not claiming to be as successful as the Wright brothers, but uh, I'm delighted to be with all of you. And uh, thank you for your uh, work in campus ministry, which is uh, so important here in Boston. We have uh, 75 colleges and universities and campus ministry is one of our uh, very big priorities for the church in this part of the world. I'd like to uh, begin my reflections tonight by uh, quoting uh, the scriptures from the book of Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your soul. Take to heart these words which I enjoin on you today. Drill them into your children. Speak of them at home and abroad, whether you are busy or at rest. Bind them at your wrist as a sign, and let them be as a pendant on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. If we really believe, passing on the faith is not an option. It's an imperative. God charged Israel with the great commandment and wants us to keep those words in our hearts, to get them outside of you, 
to get them inside your children. God is telling us. Talk about them wherever you are. When you're at home, you're walking down the street. Talk about them from the time that you get up in the morning to when you fall into bed at night. Tie them on your hands and your foreheads as a reminder. Write them on the doorposts and on the bathroom mirrors in your home, on your city gates and the dashboards of your car, and on the refrigerator door. In other words, know and live out the great commandment to pass on to your children and your children's children this faith. It kind of kills the theory of a private faith, doesn't it? If we are faithful and our faith in God means something to us, we will strive to follow his word and live out what it says. Then our faith is anything but private. We pass it on. We talk about it. We tell the story of our faith. The great evangelizer is Christ. The word made flesh, the missionary, the father, the anointed of the spirit who founds the church as an extension of himself. Today, the same Jesus gathers us in his church, instructs us with his gospel, and nurtures us with his sacraments. Having come to share our life, he invites us to share his mission. Go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Evangelization is the mission of the church, which is itself an extension of Jesus Christ, who is the magister, the teacher. He wants to communicate to us life in abundance. The mission of the church is about making disciples, helping people respond to the call to holiness by being part of a faith-filled community, a worshiping community, struggling to be faithful to the gospel. Discipleship is about living with Christ in a faith community, striving to model our lives on his teaching and example. This is not something new in our history. We've been doing it for 2,000 years. One of the early attempts is documented in a stunning book that comes to us from the first century. It's called the Didache, which means the training. It's the first training manual for initiating people into the life of the church. It's the beginning of Catholic education. It was memorized by the mentors or teachers who used it as a lesson plan, a catechism, a liturgical worship aid, and a primer for faithful discipleship. The Didache described the step-by-step -step transformation by which converts were to be prepared for a full active participation in the life of the church. The Didache shows us that for the church, teaching the faith is always a process of mentoring. Then as now, we're not transmitting our own theories or notions, but speaking and hopefully witnessing to the word of God. The word of life can never be received as mere information. The mentor was expected to illustrate, inquire, question, listen, and challenge his candidate in such ways that not only the words, but the deeper meanings of a way of life were being suitably assimilated at every step. The Didache also tries to prepare its novices for the rejection of their friends and relatives, and even by the dominant culture, which is hostile to the gospel teachings. Another early writing that's always fascinated me, also comes from the first century, is the letter to Dionetos. 
where the author is describing to his friend what Christians are like. He says, they live in the same neighborhoods, they speak the same language, they dress like everyone else, but they don't kill their babies and they respect the marriage bond. Very quaint indeed. It's a little scary to think that Dionetus's letter could have been written last week and not 2000 years ago. In today's world, Catholic education must be didache. Training in a way of life, which is increasingly alien in the secular world, where our concerns about unborn children and the sacredness of marriage makes us appear quaint and even nettlesome. We need mentors, parents, grandparents, godparents, teachers, youth ministers, neighbors, who are ready to pass on the faith. The area where we are most efficient and which hampers our attempts to pass on the faith, I believe is that of adult faith formation, which needs to reach out to three groups. First of all, to our active parishioners, who are our volunteers and lay ministers and committed Catholics. We need to help them to have a deep understanding of the faith and the richness of the scriptures, the catechism, the social encyclicals, the spiritual masters, and medical ethics. We also need outreach to the unchurched by having a good RCIA program and teams that are ever finding new ways to invite people to consider joining the church. Scripture, apologetics, and early Christian writers are important sources for our attempts to help new Catholics and prospective Catholics to discover the church's treasures of faith. The last group, the inactive Catholics, is perhaps the most difficult. And here much reflection, prayer and planning needs to take place and how to reach out to them. There are at least 17 million individuals in the United States who for reasons great and small have stormed off, dozed off, or simply fallen through the cracks. We have a responsibility to them. Christmas, Easter, weddings and funerals are moments when inactive Catholics find themselves in church. We must learn to make the most of these moments, to welcome people home, and put on the church's best face. We need to assume some responsibility for reaching out to these brothers and sisters who have walked away or just drifted away. Our belief must be in a God who so loved the world that he sent us his only son, Jesus Christ, to establish a people, a church, entrusted with his mission to make disciples of all nations and to build a civilization of love. As a young priest, I was present at the Puebla conference. And as I mentioned a moment ago, it's where I met Father Arupe and also met Archbishop Romero there. It was Pope St. John Paul II's first trip after being elected Pope. As the Holy Father's plane landed in Mexico City, all the church bells in the country rang out with joy. The successor of St. Peter was here in our midst. The crowd extended for about 80 miles along the highway between Mexico City and Puebla. People had come the day before and slept on the highway. It made me think of the words in the Acts of the Apostles where Luke describes how the people put the sick by the side of the road so that Peter's shadow would just touch them when he passed by. The crowd comprised millions of Mexicans, extending, as I say, almost 80 miles of highway connecting Mexico City and Puebla. The government had tried to discourage people from going, 
Nobody paid any attention to that plea. And afterwards, the government officials reported that there were no troublesome incidents due to the crowds as they had feared. Indeed, the crime rate fell to an all-time low when the Pope was in the country. The government speculated that even the burglars and pickpockets went for the Pope's blessing. The Holy Father, upon arriving in Puebla, got out of an open car, walked across the soccer field to a makeshift altar, and celebrated the opening mass of the Puebla Conference. I shall never forget his homily. He challenged us to be teachers and to teach the truth, the truth about Christ, about the church, and about the human person. The same message is crucial to us today. The content of our teaching must embrace all of these truths. The truth about Christ, the Son of God, true God and true man, our crucified Redeemer, our risen Lord, who has promised to be with us always and who has established his church on the rock of Peter. The truth about the church founded by Jesus on the apostles, guided by the Holy Spirit, gathering God's people around the altar, calling people to discipleship, conversion, and ministry, a church teaching with authority, witnessing to the presence of the risen Lord, serving Christ especially in the poor and the downtrodden, the truth about the human person, that each one, is an irreplaceable mystery made in God's image and likeness, called to an eternal destiny. The church's teachings on human rights, the gospel of life, sexual morality, and social justice are all corollaries of this great truth about our origins and our destiny. A few years ago, I was invited to a state dinner at the White House. The president of Brazil was visiting and they needed a bishop that spoke Portuguese. So they were very surprised when an O'Malley showed up. But uh, uh, President Bush Sr. was the president at the time. And they sat me at a table between President Bush and this lovely young lady who introduced herself as Gloria Estefan. And I said to her, do you work in the White House? And she said, no, Father, I'm a famous singer. And I said, you obviously don't sing Gregorian chant. She was a good sport about it and understood that a friar isn't necessarily acquainted with all of the cultural icons of, of our time. But in fact, we do live in a world that is obsessed by celebrities. Celebrities have replaced heroes and heroines for our young people. And oftentimes, these celebrities, for all their good looks, talent in singing, acting, or sports, live lives that are superficial, self-absorbed, and chaotic. The church has always held up for us the lives of the saints. They provide examples of the universal call to holiness. The saints model for us the struggle to overcome human weakness and sinfulness and embrace God's will in our lives. It's healthy for our young people today to hear about our saints and contemporary heroes like Dorothy Day, who, after having an abortion, and another child out of wedlock, became one of the most outstanding persons in the history of the church in our country. Our young people want to see the ideals of the gospel lived in our lives. One of the worst results of the scandal in the church can be a cynicism about the call to holiness. We run the risk of being overwhelmed by the bad example of our leaders. And we need to remind people that there have always been saints and sinners in the church. 
The church's task is to call everyone to conversion. We have our successes and our failures. The saints are the success stories our young people need to hear. It helps them to see that we are all struggling on the same path to holiness. We must break the bad habit of presenting the church in such a way that people are deceived into thinking that we can be Christians and remain strangers. The privatization of religion in today's climate of new age individualism is poisonous to the gospel message of community, of connectedness in the body of Christ. I always say being a disciple is not a solo flight. In a culture addicted to entertainment, our Catholics often find Sunday Mass a rather unsatisfying experience. I remember when I was in the seminary reading a, an interview with uh, Flannery O'Connor, who uh, was a writer in the South at a time when there were very, very few Catholics in that part of the country. And uh, as a little girl, she had a, a girlfriend, a little Baptist girl, who she was always inviting her to come to mass. And uh, finally, that little girl got permission from her mother and Flannery took her to Sunday mass. She was so excited that this Baptist friend was coming to church with her and she couldn't wait till the mass was over. And she, she said, well, what do you think? What, what, did you, what do you think? Did you like it? Did you like it? The little girl said, wow, said, you Catholics really have something. The music was so lousy. The sermon was so boring. The priest was mumbling in that language nobody could understand. And all those people were there. Well, obviously they were there not looking for entertainment, but they were there to worship and to pray. We need to bring people on the path to discipleship so that they can worship and pray. And of course, we want to have beautiful liturgies. But it's not just about a great sermon or a good music program. We need to be people who know how to pray. An experience of prayer so that when we gather for the Sunday Eucharist, we have a notion of why we're there and how to pray. There can be no Catholic life, no holiness, no discipleship without prayer. Every Catholic school, every religious education program must have a prayer component that will help our young Catholics be part of a worshiping community. Indeed, our families need to be domestic churches where we teach our children how to pray. It's only then that we, it makes sense when we come to church to be gathered around the altar as a worshiping family, to recognize Christ in the breaking of the bread, whereby partaking of the Eucharist, we become one with Christ and with one another. Our challenge is to help our people glimpse the beauty of God, the beauty of the gospel, but we must first experience it ourselves in our own interior life. We must love the church. Jesus is the bridegroom, not the widower. He does not exist separate from his bride, the church. I've always loved another ancient Christian text called the Shepherd of Hermes. It's a book of revelations granted to Hermes in Rome by the agency of two heavenly figures. The first, an old woman, and the second, an angel in the form of a shepherd. The old woman represents the church. In successive visions, she becomes younger and more beautiful. As Hermes moves on the path of conversion, 
the vision of the church's beauty becomes more apparent to him. The path to holiness is a path to the source of all goodness and truth, of absolute beauty. The character Prince Michkin in Dostoevsky's The Idiot puts it very well. He says, beauty will save the world. We want to share with new generations that being a Catholic with a deep faith, with a sense of vocation and a communal vision of our mission is a beautiful life. Our mission is about helping people catch a glimpse of that beauty that saves us. Thank you. Thank you, Cardinal O'Malley. Um, right now, if there anybody has questions for the bishop, just you can go into the chat and send them, I'm sorry, the Cardinal, and send them to um, your campus ministers. Okay, Father, we have a question here for you, Cardinal. What aspects of the Franciscan tradition that resonates in the world today? Well, that's interesting. Uh, St. Francis is certainly one of the most beloved saints in the history of the church and is popular both within Catholicism and outside of Catholicism. And actually, when Jorge Bergoglio was elected the Pope and chose the name Francis, it caused a lot of excitement everywhere in the world. And uh, the Holy Father in his... Uh, the encyclicals that he has written has chosen very uh, strong themes from the life of Francis. In, uh, in his last encyclical, uh, Fratelli Tutti, Everyone Brothers and Sisters, uh, he certainly underscores the ideal of St. Francis of being a universal brother. St. Francis uh, had a very difficult relationship with his dad. And his father finally disowned him. And, uh, but strangely enough, it allowed Francis to discover his relationship with God the Father. And as St. Francis, when he returned all of his fancy clothes to his father, he said, I've called you Pietro Bernardoni, my father, but from now on I shall say, our father who art in heaven. And his awareness of the fatherhood of God was so strong in his life that it inspired him in this uh, quest to be a universal brother, to be uh, a brother to, to everyone and also to all of creation. And certainly that theme of uh, creation is, uh, is part of the Holy Father's uh, uh, first encyclical, Laudato Si, which comes from the hymn of St. Francis to creation. St. Francis, because of this deep awareness of uh, being a child of God and uh, that Christ has come as an expression of the merciful face of God and a desire to be a universal brother, uh, allowed him to discover in Christ's life, particularly in his poverty, uh, a very special uh, means of living out the gospel. And Francis's conversion takes place when he encounters a leper. Uh, Francis had a, a terrible phobia of leprosy. And when he would see a leper, he would usually run in the opposite direction. But this particular day, grace of God touched his heart and he went over to the leper. He gave him his money, his clothes, and he kissed the leper. And later on, before he died in his last will and testament, he talks about that experience as being a life-changing experience to him. So I always say, Francis didn't cure the leper. The leper cured Francis by allowing him to overcome his fears, 
his vanity, his pride, and to discover in the leper a neighbor, a brother, a presence of Christ. So these are just some of the themes in the life of Francis that excite me and certainly are being reflected uh, in the pontificate of, of Pope Francis. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that mentors are key in the faith life. Who were some good mentors that you had in your young adult life? And do you have any good mentors now? Well, I would say that, uh, you know, my parents were our first mentors in the faith. And I had an uncle who was a diocesan priest, the one who baptized me. Uh, and at St. Luke's, we had great uh, priests and sisters there when I was growing up. Uh, but there were many, many people, I think, that, that mentored me. Uh, and certainly as a bishop, uh, uh, the, the Cardinal Archbishop of uh, Washington, who was my bishop in the time that I was there working at the Spanish Catholic Center with immigrants, uh, uh, Cardinal Hickey, who had been the Bishop of Cleveland, uh, was, was a great mentor for me. So, uh, but I think uh, our young people need mentors. And it's been my experience that in our religious education programs, where we have college students uh, teaching the young people, it's an extraordinary uh, way of communicating the faith. Young people look up to the college students, the university students, and uh, have a wonderful rapport with them. So I hope that many of you will be mentors uh, for our young Catholic children who are uh, just beginning to learn about the faith. Funny you should mention that. The next question had to do with, do you have any other suggestions for students who don't feel they know their faith well enough to maybe mentor a fellow student, but do you have any suggestions for them on how to be better mentors? Well, I, you know, uh, I think learning more about our faith is very, very important. And I presume that uh, in the, uh, the different campus ministries that there are opportunities for that, you know, uh, some of our students here have had, you know, like Catholic book clubs or discussion clubs and uh, inviting uh, people in to talk about the different aspects of our, of our faith and the social gospel of the church have been uh, uh, very important ways for us to, uh, to deepen our understanding of the great treasure that we have in our Catholic faith. Uh, you mentioned that we as Catholics need to show and share how beautiful the Catholic faith and lifestyle is. What do you think is most missing from the current message that we send out? Well, I, you know, I think a lot of people are completely unaware of the social gospel of the church and uh, how important uh, that is to a life of discipleship that we live in a culture, a dominant culture that is so highly individualistic, you know, the, the autonomous self. And, uh, and the church's vision is one of community, of being uh, connected to the Lord and to others and uh, quite different from the new age religion of, you know, uh, which is a privatization of religion a little poetry, a little ritual, uh, the warm fuzzies, uh, rather than a personal conversion that leads us to a life of service and, and, and community uh, that is the identity of the church. So. Uh, this might be fun for you. Can you tell us about a saint who is relatively unknown, but you find to have an inspiring story? Well, uh, there's a number that I, one who is very interesting and who probably most of you have not heard of uh, is a blessed, blessed Charles de Foucault, who uh, 
He lived around the time of World War I. He was a French aristocrat. He was very wealthy and uh, uh, quite a ladies' man, very popular in high society in France and uh, was in, in the military, he studied at St. Cyr, which is sort of the West Point of France. And, uh, and he became an explorer in uh, North Africa. Uh, and to be able to travel through uh, Morocco and Tunisia and those countries, he disguised himself as a rabbi so that the, the local population, and strangely enough in those days, uh, uh, the tension uh, between the Muslims and the Christians was probably greater than between Christians and Jews. So the way that he traveled was under the guise of, of a rabbi, but he was sort of a Lawrence of Arabia uh, of, the, of the church. He, he wrote books, he did maps, he won all kinds of prizes for uh, the, the studies that he did of those cultures. But while he was there living among these nomads in the desert, he became very impressed by the fact that these Muslim Berbers were so prayerful. And uh, strangely enough, that witness of the prayer of these very simple uh, nomads in the desert led him to want to know more about his own faith. And he eventually went back to France and uh, became a Trappist for a while. And then he left the Trappist and went to Nazareth to live uh, in the city where Jesus spent most of his life. And he got a job as a gardener for the poor Clares in Nazareth. And there, tried to intensely live a life of Nazareth, the hidden life of Jesus during those 30 years of working in the carpenter shop. And the sisters urged him to, uh, to go on to be ordained. And so he did. And then he went to back to the desert where he set up a hermitage, hoping to set, to start a religious community that would work there uh, in the middle of the Sahara. And he wrote a beautiful rule of life and uh, he, he incorporated all of this extraordinary spirituality of Nazareth, of adoration and hospitality uh, into the spirituality of this community that he was trying to form. Well, he didn't get one member for his community and Finally, someone who he was helping uh, shot him, killed him. A few years later, a French priest wrote a biography about him. And a young man, 16 years old, read that biography and was so impressed by it that he decided that he was going to continue this work and start that religious order of the Little Brothers of Jesus. Uh, so he went to the de desert with four men. And today there are about 13,000 members of these orders that were inspired by Charles de Foucault. And uh, as I tell my priests, I don't know how many of you saw the, the film Waking Ned Divine story about this little village in Ireland where Ned Devine buys the lottery ticket and uh, he dies of a heart attack in front of the television set when he realizes that he's won the, the, lo the lottery. And then when the villagers find out, uh, they keep his death a secret so that they can uh, share his winnings. Well, in many ways, Charles de Foucault's life was like that. He died with the winning lottery ticket. He never was able to enjoy the success of his ministry. Uh, but as Jesus says, one man sows and another reaps. And so for some people, 
uh, Blessed Charles was a terrible failure. But when you see after he died that the treasure of his spirituality and example has inspired uh, thousands of people uh, to try and live the spirituality of Nazareth uh, that Jesus has taught us during those 30 years of hidden life. And so he's one of the more unknown saints who I find uh, a, great, uh, uh, a great inspiration to me. I think I could tell by some of the faces that they were enjoying the story of him. Um, one of our students. Well, we live in a, in a world where, you know, with this cult of success, and here's a man whose life was, he went from success to failure, but in his failure is when he was truly a success. And, and sometimes I think as Christians, uh, we have to be able to, uh, to break away from this cult of success and see that uh, the cross can bring us real success and real happiness in a way that uh, the material successes the world promises us cannot give. One of our students has asked, um, you talked about viewing celebrities in the lives of the saints, but how should we look up to and view Catholic celebrities like Father Mike Schmitz and Scott Hahn, to name a few? Well, you know, I, the Holy Father is always talking about the saints next door, which I think is a great way to describe it, you know. Not all the saints are, you know, miracle workers or, or uh, you know, people founding uh, religious orders or institutions. Uh, so we have many saints among us uh, uh, who, by their lives of faithfulness and, uh, and, and charity, uh, are building up the body of Christ. And uh, so we certainly... Uh, and there can be many good celebrities in the world of sports or entertainment as well. Uh, but I think uh, the church has a, a wonderful roster that, uh, that can inspire us to lead lives of discipleship and uh, embrace a way of life that is very countercultural. Thank you. Considering that the Didache is a first century text composed in a world of a minuscule Christian minority, what challenges will we face as we apply its wisdom in a 21st century society that is largely Christian? Well, I, in many places, the world has become post-Christian. And uh, I think the recognition of that uh, is important if we are going to be faithful to the gospel. Uh, there are uh, a lot of religious symbols that uh, have uh, that are still still out there in our culture. But you know, uh, Saint Nicholas has become Santa Claus, and and uh, Saint Valentine is no longer the martyr, but you know. Uh, someone to sell chocolates and roses. And uh, so just as in those early days of Christianity, we are immersed in a culture which is very hostile to gospel values. And we can't uh, uh, fool ourselves into thinking otherwise. Uh, other, you know, otherwise we can be completely assimilated into a culture that uh, that rejects the values of the gospel. So uh, there are many things in our culture that have grown out of our Christian roots, and those things are are great blessings for us, and we need to to promote that. But uh, but there are other things, particularly as I say, this exaggerated individualism of our culture, that uh, the me first uh, attitude that. Uh, is, is not uh, a, a Christian uh, value and uh, a cult of success. So many, uh, so many aspects of a society that's become increasingly more and more materialistic and, uh, and competitive. Whereas we are called to, to build a civilization of love, to be people of a community, promoting this connectedness with God and with each other.
What would you suggest as ways to help strengthen and grow our parishes and Catholic schools? And how can we as young lay people help with this? Well, you know, I, I think that uh, young lay people have a wonderful opportunity to strengthen their parishes. So in, in many of our parishes, we see that there's a graying of the congregation and the presence of young people always brings a lot of energy uh, and hope to our parishes. And as I said before, uh, college students uh, teaching in our religious education programs are a, a great blessing for us and really help our young people to, uh, to connect with the faith. And, uh, but certainly, uh, you know, trying to, uh, to be faithful to the Sunday Eucharist and uh, to contribute uh, in whatever way we can to making that a, a beautiful and a wonderful celebration but certainly our, just our fidelity of, of, of gathering with the community of faith is, uh, is very important. And being uh, Christians who are inviting others uh, to follow the Lord and to worship him. So it's, as I say, being a disciple is never a solo flight. It's always about uh, building community, uh, witnessing to our faith and, and sharing what we have received. If someone discovered a cure for AIDS or for uh, cancer or uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, and then decided, well, I think I'll just keep this for my family and my close friends, uh, we'd say, oh, that's criminal. We have received something greater than a cure for cancer in our relationship with the Lord. And so we have a great responsibility to share that with others, to, to share the treasures that we have received. And that's what the call to discipleship is about. The church exists to evangelize. We, and as Pope Paul said once, the evangelized person is an evangelizer. So if we have been evangelized, then we are out there passing on the faith to others. It seems like the world has inherited many Catholic virtues and given them new meaning, like social justice and dignity of the individual. How do we find what's good of these worldly values while making sure we remain true to our Catholic understanding of them? Well, you know, I, I think that uh, our social gospel uh, is shared with people outside of the church, uh, logically, but, uh, but the undergirdings for the social gospel are the dignity of every human being made in the in image and likeness of God. And you won't find, I, I think it's difficult to find, outside of uh, Christianity and the Christian anthropology, a, a coherence and a consistency uh, that you have in our social teachings that shows the dignity of the person from the first moment of conception till natural death. And uh, you know that there are many people who are very strong in being anti-racist or uh, and anti-exploitation uh, of the poor, but at, at the same time, don't recognize the importance of protecting human life when it's most fragile in the womb or uh, taking care of the dying in a way that allows them to die with dignity and with love. So I, I think helping people outside the church, first of all, to see that we have a, a very coherent uh, social gospel, but we need to be coherent in the way that we live it ourselves to be able to witness to it. Uh, I think Mother Teresa was a great 
a witness to the gospel of life because people saw how uh, consistent she was in the way that she lived her life, serving the poor, serving the, the most forgotten and abandoned. And so I, I think that uh, in our own lives, we need to have that kind of consistency and faithfulness uh, so that we will be able to invite others to embrace uh, our Christian anthropology and these, the gospel of life. You mentioned that we need to be a praying people and you mentioned the universal call to holiness. Does this give new meaning to the church understood as a priestly people? Well, we are priestly people because we are called to, to pray and to celebrate the sacraments uh, uh, together. Uh, certainly we're in this time of Lent now, which is uh, a baptismal retreat, uh, the great uh, the geography of Lent always begins with the desert, Jesus going into the desert. and We're invited to follow him for 40 days and 40 nights. And in the desert, uh, one of the strong symbols is the, the lack of water in the desert, because in the desert, we can learn to appreciate more profoundly uh, the power of the water of baptism and what our baptismal commitment means. Uh, during Lent, we live a baptismal retreat, accompanying the new Catholics who on the first Sunday of Lent were part of the rite of election and will be baptized on Holy Saturday when we all renew our baptismal vows. And so uh, Lent should be a time for us to reflect on what it means to be a disciple, what it means to be uh, baptized into Jesus Christ and called to live in friendship with him and in his community. Uh, so the part of the aspect of the desert is this lack of water so that we can learn to appreciate how precious the water of baptism is. The other aspect of Lent uh, in the desert experience is silence. Remember a few years ago, Mother Teresa came to visit us here in, uh, in Massachusetts and uh, where thousands of people turned out to see her. I mean, it was just amazing. And I saw the people lining up because Mother Teresa was giving them this little white card. And I said, oh, I wonder if that's her business card. Is that her, her cell number or her, uh, her, uh, her, email address or something. So I got in line to get one of those cards. When I got to mother, uh, she gave me the, uh, the card and on it was written, the fruit of silence is prayer. The fruit of prayer is faith. The fruit of faith is love. The fruit of love is service. The fruit of service is peace. What a beautiful program for Lent, but it begins with silence. We live immersed in noise and distraction, and Lent is an invitation to make time and space for God so that we can listen to his word in our hearts and to understand how much he loves us and what he is calling us to do with our lives, why we're here, what our mission is. How do we maintain a faith with such a rich intellectual tradition, but avoid the pitfall of becoming like the Pharisees? Well, <laughs> the Pharisees uh, live their faith on the outside. And Jesus is always inviting us to uh, to follow a path inward into our heart. Uh, it's not a religion of appearances, of always judging and condemning others. The Pharisees uh, are shown in the gospel to be people who are very judgmental, are very much concerned about externals, and external compliance. 
are very concerned about money. And discipleship calls us to a life of humility and love. And so it's not just the intellectual uh, aspects of our life that are important, but the sincerity of living those values in our hearts. In the, uh, the celebration of uh, Ash Wednesday, uh, the gospel from Matthew is read and G it, you almost get the impression that Jesus is warning us about uh, uh, fasting and almsgiving and prayer. Uh, because he's telling us not to do it the way that the Pharisees do. Uh, what gives meaning to our acts of penance and our uh, works of mercy uh, is not just what we do, but how we do it. It must be done with humility and with love and with a sense of mercy and not for just the appearances, and uh, I think that that uh, uh, is very important. I know that we live in a world that's becoming so polarized and people are always beating up on each other. And uh, it's uh, very interesting uh, that uh, a few years ago, uh, Cardinal Martini came out with a book called How Jesus Manages His Time. Uh, Uh, how Jesus manages his time. And he gives the six priorities uh, of Jesus in the gospel. And now, if someone had asked me, what would be the number one priority? I would have said, well, announcing the kingdom. But analyzing the four gospels, this wonderful scripture scholar has come out with Jesus's first priority was taking care of the sick and works of mercy. But when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because mercy is the context in which the gospel can be announced. People are going to listen to us only if they know that we care about them, that we love them. And so if we think that we are going to convert people to a, a pro-life uh, position by insulting them or uh, railing at them, uh, that's not the way that it will happen. We have to show ourselves as a people of mercy and of love, and then we will be able to announce the good news of the kingdom. So uh, I think there's there's great danger to living our faith only on the surface, but the interior life, the journey inward, uh, a life of prayer and reflection, trying to find motivation uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, in the mercy that Jesus teaches us, is what will allow us to truly transmit uh, the difficult and challenging words of the gospel. As Pope Francis in one place in the uh, uh, Evangelii Gaudium uh, talks, he said he, he, does, he doesn't want us to be prophets of doom, condemning people. He said he wants us to announce the difficult teachings of the gospel with confidence and to live them with joy. And that's what will invite people to embrace the gospel and Christianity in their lives. Um, a few people have asked me to ask you what your daily life as a Cardinal looks like and what are your favorite parts of serving the church as a Cardinal? <laughs> well, my daily life is like any other, uh, uh, any other Bishop, I suppose. Uh, in Boston, we have uh, you know, a lot of different ministries and uh, a couple of seminaries and uh, uh, 
almost 300 parishes and over 100 schools. And so a lot of these institutions of the church uh, require the presence uh, of the bishop. Um, certainly, uh, our outreach to our priests, we have a lot of priests. I try and meet with the, uh, the priests ordained in the last five years, which are about 40 or so. Uh, on a monthly basis, and uh, you know, also meeting with our religious and our young people. I, you know, I've been having some Zoom calls like this with our own campus ministry people here. So my life is very uh, uh, varied. There's a lot of different kinds of activities, and uh, uh, it, it, it it's always. Uh, it's never boring. There's always something new happening. What are my favorite things? I suppose uh, the, the pastoral uh, outreach, the celebration of the sacraments, uh, you know, and as a cardinal uh, being uh, with the Holy Father on a regular basis, we usually would meet every six weeks. And now with COVID on, we're we're using Zoom, believe it or not, to meet with Pope Francis, and uh, uh, he is an extraordinary person, and I'm happy to uh, be able to be of some service to him. It's a great joy. Uh, we have about maybe eight more minutes. Um, so one of the questions that's come through from the students is, what do you recommend for college students to do daily in order to grow in their faith? Well. I think to have a rule of life is important. Uh, you have to have a game plan. If you're gonna practice for a sport or learn how to play a musical instrument or you're gonna lose weight or whatever it is, you have to have a strategy. And we need a, a game plan in our spiritual life. We need a rule of life uh, that helps us put aside time and space for God and a time for prayer, a time for the sacraments, a time for spiritual reading, a time for works of mercy. And uh, the secret of success is not biting off more than you can chew, but incrementally to add to your rule of life, to make more time and space for God and the works of God. But if you don't have a game plan, uh, it won't happen. <laughs> and so Lent is a good time to review our life in the light of the gospel and decide, you know, how am I going to be more serious in my life of discipleship? How am I going to give more time to prayer, more time to service? Uh, and part of a, a, a rule of life always has to include a revision of life, a, a self-examination in the light of the gospel to see how we're doing, how we're living these ideals daily. So an examination of conscience uh, is an important part of it, uh, a review of how we are being faithful to our rule of life. I think our last question this evening comes from a student who identifies herself as a Catholic schoolgirl. Uh, growing up, she felt that her Catholic school system did a great job growing her Catholic intellect, but very little in fostering a real and personal relationship with Christ. How can Catholic schools grow in this area? Well, I think that uh, the development in our Catholic schools now of more of a campus ministry approach is a better one. I, we need to have retreats, but there needs to be service projects, but the service projects need to be related to our faith and to the Eucharist, uh, not just uh, some philanthropic activity, but really an expression of our call to discipleship and to service. Uh, and certainly, uh, our religious instruction needs to, I think, spend more time on teaching people how to pray and how to reflect on the gospels. Um, but uh, 
but we need good uh, mentors <laughs> for our young people. And I hope that many of you will, will take up that challenge. Thank you. Um... That is it for the, I apologize for the few questions we didn't get to this evening. Uh, but I think the Cardinal covered the answers and some of his other answers. Um, and I believe we're going to close with a prayer unless there's something else I'm not aware of. Um, before we do get to that, um, thank you first of all very much Cardinal O'Malley for being with us. Um, we just love to really quickly give a quick um, plug for what we're going to be talking about next week. And then Cardinal, we would love to ask you to send us off with a blessing um, if we can if we can ask that. Um, but so next week, we'll be gathering again at the same time, the same place to continue this conversation, talking specifically about the relationship of faith and reason in our tradition. And we'll be inviting Dr. Beth Rath from John Carroll University to lead us in that conversation. Um, so keep with us going forward because we're really excited about this whole series. And again, thank you very much, Cardinal O'Malley for, uh, for kicking us off and for joining with us um, today. With that said, could we ask you to send us off for the blessing? Certainly, Steve. And I want to thank all of you for, for tuning in. I've enjoyed being with you and uh, I will keep you in prayer. And uh, I hope that this uh, Lenten retreat for all of us will be a time that draws us closer to the Lord and to one another in our communities. And now we bow our heads asking for God's blessing upon us. May the blessing of Almighty God, through the intercession of Our Lady and St. Joseph and all the saints, descend upon you and your ministries and your loved ones in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless all of you. Good being with you. Thank you so much, Cardinal. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Very good. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night, John. <laughs>